The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, fighting treachery in a far future of wonder and war, hunting alien collaborators, and the conclusion of the groundbreaking Queendom of Saul series. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshirod. Today, we bring you the dynamic writing duo of John Ringo and Lydia Scherer, who sat down with Griffin Barber to discuss their novel, Into the Real. The book came out back in April in hardcover and ebook formats, so there's a chance you may have already read it. If so, we think you'll love this behind the scenes chat. And if you haven't yet gotten your hands on the book, we think you will love hearing about it and it will make you sure to want to check it out. But first, the news. June is almost in the books, which means as of next Tuesday, the July mass market paperbacks will be hitting bookstore shelves. Let's take a look at what's coming up. First up, we have The Serpent by David Drake, the third in his Time of Heroes series. Young Knight Pal is one of the most respected members of Lord John's Hall of Champions. Now, Pal will need all his talent to deal with the monsters the Waste throws at him, to unify the growing realm, and to rescue a damsel in distress who has been locked in a force field for decades. Next up, we have The Family Business by Mike Coopery. A federal recovery agent must hunt down a young woman implanted with an alien device and her mentally unstable former commando boyfriend. The job sounds easy, but the young woman may have been implanted with something else, something much more important to the visitors and to the free people of Earth. And finally, we have the third installment in Will McCarthy's Queendom of Saul series, To Crush the Moon. Once the Queendom of Saul was a glowing monument to humankind's loftiest dreams, ageless and immortal, its citizens lived in peaceful splendor. But as Saul buckled under the swell of an immorbid population, space itself literally ran out. That's The Serpent by David Drake, The Family Business by Mike Coopery, and To Crush the Moon by Will McCarthy, all coming very soon to mass market paperback. Michael Z. Williamson's Target Terror may clock in at over 700 pages, but we're sure it will leave you wanting more page-turning techno-thriller action. So for the month of June, we're offering ebook discounts on all our techno-thriller backlist titles, including Tom Crapman's Countdown series, John Ringo's Paladin of Shadows series, and the Dead Six books by Larry Correa and Mike Kupari. Details and a complete list of books are available at Bain.com. And that's it for the news. Hi there, I'm Griffin Barber, your host for today's edition of the Bain Free Radio Hour. Best known for her Love, Lies, and Hocus Pocus universe, books full of magic and snark, Lydia Scherer has authored more than 10 novels and dozens of short stories across multiple series in that universe so far. John Ringo is the author of several New York Times bestselling series ranging from near-future zombie, post-apocalyptic survival and reconstruction to far-future warfare series. He's also collaborated with some of the most popular authors in the genre on hit series. He's continuing this habit of smash collaborations by co-authoring with Lydia Scherer, the novel Into the Real, new from Bain Books. Hello and welcome, Lydia and John. Howdy. So I, I've kind of uh, gotten a new uh, question that I kind of like to ask everybody. I call it the hardest question first, but uh, and for, it's for both of you. Um, what's the coolest aspect of Into the Real for each of you? I will always Lydia and forever. To, no, no, you're the senior author. You have to go first. Um, it was a, it was something that both of us felt. Um, but it, the the coolest, 
the coolest things in almost all books are the characters. And in some cases in books, there will be uh, creations which are characters in themselves. Um, an example of that outside of my books is the, uh, the, the culture books, which apparently Elon Musk is a big fan of because he's named his drone ships after ships from the culture. Mm -hmm. um, one of my books, there's, a, there's something which in and of itself has no speaking or anything else, but it's Troy, which is a gigantic battle station that's created. And Troy in and of itself becomes a character. It's really a setting, but Troy is a character at the same time. Right. Um, in this novel, the two things that I found coolest, um, one of them, you know, was my idea, and the other one was collaborative with Lydia, was first that the main character, when she plays games online, um, assumes an alter ego of originally it was supposed to be a Vietnam era vet and it's now a Vulcans Vulcans era mercenary. Um who's this old guy who the only life that he's got anymore is playing video games online and presumably being one of the one of the people I'm like everybody figures he's probably on a future version, let's put it make clear, of like 4chan or Arfcom or whatever. Because he's this seriously He's a serious old timey vet that has been there, done that, um, you know, got his legs blown off in in Colombia and a car bomb, you know, that kind of thing. He's never real clear about exactly when he got invalided out or exactly how, you know, that's not something he talks about. Right. And this character, Larry the Snake, um, is actually a initially when she created him, fourteen year old girl. Um who had, who on her wall she has all these notes of you know sayings that Larry that she has picked up from hanging out on boards and has modified slightly. So she says things, and sometimes they they make absolutely no sense. Like um, uh, one night in Caracas will make the tough guys tumble, right? And somebody else says, "I've been to Caracas. It's not all that bad." He goes, "You haven't been to the parts of Caracas I've been to." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so one of the one of the cooler aspects is very minor it's a little it's a little character item character trait it's just larry the snake um because larry the snake is fun just as a separate character right. the other is the ai um because it's this very jeeves sort of british butler snarky ai that lydia did a great job with the snark um <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my that's my strong point. Snark is is what I really like to lean into in books. So I actively looked for ways to make Hugo as snarky as possible. Yeah, Hugo is <clears throat> Hugo is, is is a great character. Um, and for me, the coolest things in books are always the characters. Um, in some cases, it's settings, but it's mostly the characters for me. Yeah. 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 Um, for me, um. I don't, I don't know when I when I think of the coolest aspect, I don't really think of characters because it's characters are almost in a separate category for me. So I mean, I love the characters. The characters are awesome, and they are what drives the story. Um, but in terms of like the coolest aspect of Into the Rule, I think one of my favorite parts of like the development and the writing um, was coming up with all the different um, transdimensional monsters uh, with their different classes and their different abilities, their different forms and strengths and weaknesses, and their like attack strategies. And basically planning out, okay, it's this is the class here, it's attacks and weaknesses, how is it going to behave? And how might it like alter that behavior <clears throat> once Lynn comes in contact with it and it like starts learning? Because you know, the the TDMs are, you know, we have we're we're not really saying too much about them yet, but they're right. not completely unthinking but it's more of like a hive mind type thing. So they're, so they're, you know, they don't like come up with strategy like an individual, like a human being would, but also they're not completely mindless, you know. Well, they, they follow the game way. logic. Yes, yeah. Well, well yeah. no. They follow a logic. The game, the game logic follows them. Right. So, <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> they change Some and the AI out. has to like, race to catch up and be like whoa what is this thing doing like um 
So that was a lot of fun developing all those. And honestly, I'm a little bit daunted by having to come up with a whole new series of TDMs for book two, because, you know, of course we're increasing. It's just, I, I used all of like the easy stuff <laughs> now I got to be more and more creative, which is going to be fun, of course, but I used all the easy stuff, the easy names, the easy kind of like, um, you know, proto like fantasy, like the imps and the goblins and a lot of the stuff, of course, you know, was stuff that John came up with initially and had his first, you know, the first like 10 or so monsters on there that he came up with. And then I kind of built on that and added like another 10 to 15 more. Um, but that was a lot of fun, especially coming up with it. The way to get terms. away from that is to get out of Northern European. When, yes. I, was doing the, uh, when I was doing the MHI books, um, mm -hmm. I found a whole bunch of resources online for non-Northern European uh yeah, I was looking. I, yeah, I used I used some Indian, um, some some Indian like India Indian um, ones and some Japanese ones as well. Um, and I'll continue to look into like you know Ru I mean I guess Russia is still Northern European, but like South America and, and Africa, especially Africa and, and yeah. get some stuff down there. But anyway, that was probably the coolest aspect in terms of you know like getting to write the book and like designing stuff. So. So that uh, is a good segue into the next one. So uh, it sounds like you didn't stumble into it so much as the characters kind of developed it for you, John. The, the That cool factor was something you built into it or that the characters kind of dictated as they went along or uh, that kind of thing. Um, do you think it was more the characters telling you or uh, more driven like you were going to? Oh, um, well... The character, the character who was supposed to be the primary foil and antagonist, uh, Elena, um, was more or less a generic mean girl character. Um, you know, you might as well watch Heather's for Elena. Um, but the character within her team, which is the 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 thorn in her side, Ronnie, was actually based on a real person named Ronnie, who was just a total annoyance for my daughters their entire time in school. Um, <laughs> uh, and he was. He was really, really smart. Um, and he, you know, he had a lot of he had a lot of strong points, but he just had to be obnoxious all the time and he was extremely misogynistic. Now I have been accused of misogyny any number of times. And, you know, so I don't like to throw around the term misogynistic. Ronnie is a misogynist. Oh, wow. he's very, he is very misogynistic. But there's a very good reason why. Like, it's not, it didn't just exist in a vacuum and he just decided to be a jerk, as it says in the first book. You know, usually people who are jerks are jerks because they learned that from somebody else. Yeah. And um, that, uh, that was one of the things I admired about this was that everybody's got their reasons yeah. for doing what they're doing and acting the way they're acting. That uh, was really well done. Um, um, Edgar was also based on a real person. Oh, um, I want to meet this real person. Edgar's so cute. <laughs> well, Edgar's probably like 50 now. No, Ed, okay, Edgar would be okay. like 50, okay. 60, something. <laughs> um, but it was based on a backstory of one of the NCOs of my battalion back in the Army. Um, and he, he actually had not been really small uh, or had not been really big. He'd, he'd actually grown up very skinny. Um, but he was a Samoan, and at one point, well, he was half Samoan, and at one point when he was in uh, middle school, um, somebody found out that even though he, he appeared to not be really much of anything, uh, they did something which offended him, which he was never real clear about, except that it had to do with his sister, and he wasn't, you know, it, it back in those days, it definitely wasn't rape or something like that, but it was they had in some way offended his sister and he's like, yeah, I, I kind of had to spend some time at YDC. Um, but it was at YDC cause uh, it was at YDC that one of the, the, the guards, one of the jailers who they try to try to counsel kids as well. And frequently that doesn't work very well but with him. It's like, when he hit puberty, he got a real rage problem going. And so the guy said, well, the answer is to work out. You know, you got to work that out of you. So by the time I knew Sergeant Panapa, 
He was a freaking monster, right? And just the most nicest guy you could ever possibly be. So he's driving into work one day um, uh, on Yadkin Road, which is the main road going into 82nd Airborne Divisions area of Fort Bragg. And guy in front of him stops real quick to, as it turns out, make a left-hand turn. He's got a slam on his brakes. Guy behind him hits it. It's like, right? And left-hand lane, obviously, four-lane road. So he gets out, middle of traffic, walks back to the guy. He's going to say, hey, you know, let's just pull it over the side. We'll, you know, we'll switch insurance cards. Sergeant Padoppi, he's the most laid-back guy ever. Dude behind him, white dude, gets out. And is just raging at him. The guy's just wearing his, the, the, the guy that has hit him, has on his BDU pants and brown T-shirt, right? So Sergeant Padoppa's like, you know, we can just pull over the side and exchange, you know, he's real calm and everything. There's witnesses to this. And the guy takes a swing at him and actually hits him. And the guy's described as kind of short and kind of pudgy. And he hits Sergeant Padoppa. Sergeant Padoppa just kind of looks at him for a second and lays the guy out. Turns out he's a captain. Uh-oh. So Padoppa's got to be court-martialed. Aww. Which he is. He has to go up before court martial. He's in E6 at the time. He's looking to go in Leavenworth. He's sitting in an officer. There were multiple witnesses to it that were coming over and, and talking to people. And uh, and all the witnesses said the captain was completely in the wrong. The captain threw a punch. I can't remember if it landed or not, but, uh, you know, and he did not identify himself as an officer. He was not in uniform. So Panapa is exonerated and the captain's court martial. And he gets wow. uh, <coughs> but Panapa is one of those great NCOs. And so Edgar's background is Panapa. Um, cool. but just that little tiny bit. You know, right. it's it's that he when he was in middle school, somebody offended his sister. He ended up going to YDC. So it was a serious incident. Um and when he was in YDC was when he started working out. Uh, that was one of the interesting things I found in the book, too, was that you alighted to a bunch of things that might have gone on, but you didn't get into the specifics because it was not was necessary Lynn's story to tell how that came about. So, yeah, and it's it's not it's not hugely important about Edgar. You know, we're not going to do an Edgar origin story. There's no point to an Edgar origin story. I mean, story. like, I don't know if the fans will pay for it, you know? <laughs> well, what we're actually writing right now is Edgar's origin story. Yeah, yeah. Um, Edgar and Lynn and Dan and Mac and Ronnie and, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then the other characters in the team more or less came about as a lot of it was Lydia's writing. Um, but they were more or less, I want don't want to say stereotype characters, but they were they were characters that would have filled in that environment. I don't know how much of that Lydia brought in. Well, so I was brought in a lot. So I was looking at it um, from a bit of a uh, uh, like wow dungeon crawl <laughs> point of view, to where right. you've got all your character roles. So you've got your tank, you've got your uh, dots, you've got your, yeah, your DPS, you've got your, your healer, you know, so you've got the different roles. And of course that's flexible because there's a whole bunch of different variations on the roles that can work well together. But I did, I think John gave me like, like a short paragraph, a piece of the original five person team. And then of course, you know, there was about 40,000 words or so of the original you know, what, six, seven or so chapters of the book that he had done that he gave to me. And, and I used that as a base for the rest of the novel. Um, <clears throat> and so there were a couple scenes with them and, you know, I got like a little bit of a feel for what he was going for. And then I fleshed out their backstory and kind of gave them, you know, all the whys and their strengths and weaknesses and what their role would be. And, you know, and we talked about it and, and you know, agreed upon the role. So it's not so much that they're stereotypes it's that they're archetypes. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so did any of them surprise you? Did any of the characters kind of like, oh, that that's kind of cool. I'm going to roll with that. Um, so I don't really, John and I work very in very different ways in terms of how we write, at least as I have understood, as John has described to me how he writes. Um, I don't, <clears throat> I'm very much a plotter and a planner and I'm very uh, like follow the logical 
you know, and I'm sure all writers do this to an extent. Um, but before I write like a single word, like I have the whole character sheet and I've thought about the character for hours in terms of like, what is logical if, if this is true, if, you know, A, then what comes from that? Or if A plus B plus C, then what happens? So they're from this place, they have these motivations, they have this, you know, cultural background, they grew up in this way, you know, these are their goals in life, therefore, how would they act? And for yeah, me she personally- is a, she's, a, she's very much a detail outline, um, long character sheets, you know, everything absolutely set up, laid out in advance, think about it, you you physically do the, uh, uh, you know, you, you rehearse some of the actions to make sure that that's actually how people are going to move in that situation. There's nothing wrong with that. David Drake is the same one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David Drake is exactly the same thing. God knows how many novels where everything's just precisely laid out in advance, and then he just sits down and he writes the book, or... A precise, he does 35,000 word outlines <clears throat> that are not like my outlines are like, and then maybe we'll kind of throw something in here, right? Um, his are scene by scene, you know, they're, 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 uh, I, I want to say script treatments. Mm -hmm. Um, he doesn't have the dialogue in them, um, and he doesn't have specific descriptions, but he's got a general description of um, the character is sitting inside of a gray room, you know, which is the bad, but. There's a there's a, a well made uh, uh, electrical outlet, but the wall has been drilled through with a yellow wire. I mean, it's right. you know he, he right. does that sort of thing, and then you're supposed to write it in to to to, to fill it all out and turn it into prose. Yeah. When you get one of these thirty five thousand word outlines, I've done three of those. Pardon me, no, I've done three of those. One of which was never used. Um, Two of them, one of them was The Hero with Mike Williamson, and the other one was uh, uh, Road to Damascus. Um, the Hero, Mike took a lot of stuff in a, in a different direction and stayed kind of with the outline. Lydia, Lydia just took everything in the outline and expanded it hugely. Or not Lydia, um, uh, Linda just took everything in the outline and expanded it hugely. Right. right. So at this point, I'm like, with my collaborators like this, I just give them a general, here you go. Um, this is kind of what I think we should do, and we can sit down. And then if my collaborator wants to sit down there and do a 35,000 word outline with every scene aligned and every character having a 15 page character sheet and backstory and everything else, that's fine. As long as I don't have to do that much work. Right. <laughs> Well, well, so I, <clears throat> the way I always put it to people who are like, well, what's it like pantser versus plotter? Like, what's the difference? Is that um, often plotters do more of the work up front. And because things are more planned out in detail up front, there's less revising and less of drafts you have to go through. Um, whereas in general, of course, it differs from person to person and from project to project. But in general, someone who is um, who is more pantsing or discovery writing, as Steve Diamond likes to say. I listen to a lot of Larry and Steve's uh, writer dojo. He's like, I don't like, you know, pantser. It's discovery writer. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you be a well, discovery writer. <laughs> one of the things about my universe is where, you know, they, you know, a pantser, somebody who's just writing by the seat of the pants, is that uh, an example is uh, Black Tide starting with Under Graveyard Sky, okay? Yeah. I sat down and I wrote Black Tide in a month and a half. I, I, I wrote Under Graveyard Sky in a month and a half, and it was pretty much the same for the next two books. Um, and then I was done. It was a trilogy, except that the story wasn't done. There just had to be one more book. I was wandering around the house just... In just aggravated because I loved writing the books so much and and, and finally Miriam said, Oh, just write another book. So I sat down and I wrote um Strands of Sorrow. Um but I had thought about stories involving many of the same characters in a post apocalyptic environment. And the reason I phrase it that way is because it was multiple different environments. I had thought about it for a year and a half before I put the first sentence down. Right. 
so a lot of times pantsers aren't writing by the seat of their pants. It's just that they've got what I do is I used to call it um, uh, pearls of fire. Um, what I have is scenes that have gripped me in my head that I write from one scene to the next. Right. Um, but then sometimes pearls of fire just drop in unexpectedly. Like the, the last concert was because I was actually listening to a Billy Joel song called Miami, Miami 2017. <laughs> and, uh, they turned their power down, but we went underground and, and the show went on instead or something like that. I can't remember the exact lyrics, but, uh, we had a concert up in Brooklyn and they turned our power down and drove us underground. Um, so it was just, I was listening to Miami 2017 while I was writing it. It's like, people are going to be doing just rage concerts. Yeah. Just, you know, it's the end of, of everything. They're going to do that. And then I was like, Voltaire would definitely do that. So I had to write the last concert and the last concert was such a great, capping you know at, at a, right. a climax for the the new york, new york portion of the story yeah. the new york portion of the story didn't even occur to me until i was writing the book yeah. but i had written in my head new york stuff before that right in completely different universe in, in yeah. a, the same characters different universe Right. I think, though, that, you know, you are a, a different pantser than... Yeah, I think you're a very different pantser, John, than most pantsers. <laughs> From what I have talked to other pantsers about how they pants, um, <laughs> so the difference between John and I is really we do a lot of the same things in terms of plotting, but the difference is I write it down because right. my memory sucks. John, I have no idea how you keep all those things in your head for a year. Like, I can't so, keep the stuff in my head for five minutes. So does mine. The thing about it is, <laughs> is there any scene in any book that you have written that you can remember and just think about, man, that is so cool? I mean, yes, there are scenes that I really enjoy. Okay, but well, those are the only scenes to leave in the book. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> wow. That's it. That's yeah. the answer. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, if you but, can't remember it, it doesn't need to be on paper. But I'm not talking about scenes. I'm talking about the exact details of the dialogue and the prose. So I will, when I'll, I'll go on walks to write. Oh, well, yeah. I'll, I, when I get to those scenes that I'm writing, I mean, um, she's some psycho anime chick. Uh, you know, I'm special forces. She's some psycho anime chick. That just kind of flows from yeah, I well, mean, that kind of stuff. Well, so I'll have that happen in my head, though. I'll be, I usually go on walks when I'm plotting because movement, movement helps me think more clearly. And so I will have fully formed scenes come into my head and play out like I'm watching a TV with dialogue. And if I don't write it down on my phone right then, I will forget these awesome like lines. That's another reminder of John of, uh, John of Dave. Dave rides his yeah, motorcycle when he's plotting. Which, which Dave? Yeah, I used to record it. Which Dave? Drake. Oh, okay, okay. Because there's like three or four different Bane Dra Daves yeah. that you could be talking well, he, about. He's already, about he's already spoken about already spoken about him. So the, but yeah, Dave Drake uh, would ride his motorcycle to cogitate on plot problems. And, I yeah. used to drive around yeah. and think about it or go for walks. Yeah. So I, I, I used to do that. Uh, yeah. I, I, I really think that's a really cool uh, thing to think on in terms of this, the – you know, how you're doing it and where you're doing it, and especially for writers, but more for the fans. Um, I, I've always enjoyed a good, good video game, and though first-person shooters are definitely not my thing, um, I, when I read all the cool references to gaming and the, the world building that was done on uh, Into the Real, I felt a strong charge, you know, hey, these guys get me. <laughs> um, tell your fans what excited you about weaving the gaming through the story and uh, that kind of thing. John, you go first. You go first this time. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, right, please understand, when it came to... Okay, I'll go first. When it came to things like Warmonger, which is the Call of Duty, whatever, yeah. it's not real clear exactly what's going on, what the plot to it is or anything. All that I did was I threw in, like, the name, right? And it's a, it's a first-person shooter. And that's really all you know about Warmonger is that it's, You don't need to know anymore. Yeah. You don't need to know anymore. When it came to Into the Real, I flat off ripped off Pokemon. 
um, more I got or less. I, I, have to change, that, I had to change some of that, you know, copyright okay. reasons. Yeah, um, more or less. But then I took not all, not really far future, but relatively near future technologies that I knew were coming along, like what's called reality skinning, right. which is you'll be wearing glasses just like I, all three of us are wearing. And what you're seeing, like the background for Lydia and Griffin, they do not, in fact, have a starry background in the background, right? So you'll walk into a restaurant and, yeah, you'll walk into a restaurant and instead of seeing all normal restaurant patrons sitting around, you'll be in a World of Warcraft inn, right, where some people are... are are orcs and some people are humans and whatever you know is is in that so you'll actually be able to to see a completely different reality while interacting with reality right so you can have a fantasy environment a science fiction environment that that is what you are seeing but it's not reality so that was one of the things that i wanted to weave into into the real because the main character was very, she was a pure, what we call online gamer. Right. And she would go to school and that would be her only physical contact with people other than her mother. She would go home and she would go online and she would become this super badass Larry the Snake. Um, and now she has to actually go out into the real world and interact with real people. Yeah. And she's very, very uncomfortable with that concept. What's also um, one of the things that was kind of neat about that for me was it's very timely. Uh, you know, people are trying to rediscover how to interact in the real world now that they've been on quarantine for however long. Right. So it, it really is kind of like, oh, this is a bit much. <laughs> and there are and people we, yeah. that we have to talk to and sweat and bugs and, and, and sweat know. and bugs and <laughs> yeah. pollen. I might have pollen. to shake oh. somebody's hand. <laughs> Correct. So, uh, and for you, Leah? Um, so I, I, I thought of, I pondered these questions beforehand because you're helpful enough to send them to us beforehand. Um, and don't give away my secrets. Be, uh, it, no, that's just polite. That's just being polite. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about this in terms of <clears throat> what I, you know, like there's mechanics to the game that were a lot of fun to come up with. Um, and I have to say a word for my wonderful husband, David, who, uh, without whom I really could not have done this because he is the big gamer. And he is, I, I mean, he, we just kickstarted his first game and it hit, I think we were $36,000. So, I mean, that went pretty well. Um, but he just kickstarted his first game that he designed and he's been like, he's a dungeon master for, you know, D and D and runs his own games and he, designs games and he's played wow for decades and you know so he's he's the game master of our family <clears throat> and so i've gamed plenty but i've never really cared or gotten into the details of why games have the different stats and the different whatevers and why they work the way they work i just accept that it is so he was the one who helped me plan out and make sure like my levels made sense and this so I did enjoy all that stuff, especially working with my husband on that. But the thing that really excited me about writing a book about gaming and the, and into the real, like into the real world um, was that like gamers for people who are not gamers are often misunderstood in a lot of ways. Um, you know, people are like, oh, like, why do you like gaming? Like, you're such a weirdo, you know? And then, like, they holler over sports and, like, a football team. We're like, come on, it's that. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it anyway, doesn't count if yeah. it's Madden football. Yes, right. yes, it doesn't count. So anyway, so there's a lot of reasons that people game. Um, but a lot of the reasons come down to people have a strong creative drive and a desire for discovery and adventure. Um, and it's And those are amazing qualities. Um, and they make for great people, but it can be really hard translating those qualities um, into person-to-person -person interactions because most games are not do not involve person-to-person -person interaction. You might have like you know your team that you talk to via your headphones and and typing and stuff, but that really is very very different from face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and so, 
it was very satisfying to write about gamers with all of their flaws and their strengths, um, to write about Lynn as this person who is awkward and is, you know, her, her, her health and her body, it's unhealthy. She doesn't look all that great. You know, she's pasty white. Uh, you know, she's horrible with like talking to people and doesn't really know what to say. And is like, blah, blah. Well, and you has self image issues. Like, yes, yeah, has, has, has and uh, terrible self image issues. Um, and like all, you know, her, her, her for the four guys on her team, you know, they're all like goofy and geeky and weird and, you know, kind of like, whoa, like in some way or another. Um, and yet when they're forced to interact as a team and they're forced to deal with the real world and with responsibilities that have very physical consequences. See, that's the thing with a lot of games. There's no physical consequences. There's no real life like societal consequences, but into the real, because it's in the real world, like at school and, you know, at these tournaments and like with their parents, like there's so many serious real world consequences that involve your physical body. Um, when you involve your physical body, it changes like your brain chemistry. And so they're developed and matured in a way that could never happen with a virtual game. Um, and so it was really, really satisfying taking these people with all these amazing, like, gamer qualities and just showing how those translate very well into real life once you put the work and the dedication into deciding that building One of the relationships about gamers is important. Is that they're obsessive. Yeah. Um, and this is a situation that requires obsession. Mm -hmm. So the one positive thing, they didn't bring a lot of physicality to this. Um, they also have a tendency to be very smart, the ones that are at the high end of gaming, um, because you have to figure out what the what the tactical situation is. Right. So they brought smarts and they brought obsession. They just had to figure out how to physically do it. And since, like me, they spend all their time in a chair, um, <laughs> they didn't have a lot of physicality at first. Right. Um, the... Uh, that yeah. yeah so i that's probably the aspect that i most enjoyed and just being able to explore the different aspects of being a gamer and how you could and honestly i would love if a game like into the real existed like i can't really get into wii because like even though like you can do physical stuff it's still very clunky and clumsy and it just feels just kind of dumb but if i had like the glasses the ar reality and it all like looked real and i had like the baton that's actually in the shape of the weapon that I'm using, like that would be amazing. Like I would totally play the frick out of that game. It would be so yeah, which much is fun. coming, which is very yes, much coming. eventually, in, but I'll be too old by then. <laughs> no, you won't. I don't think so. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I used to, I used to work for a company uh, called virtual world um, and uh, managing the, that stuff. And one of the things that we always had with, with that was because the, uh, to get depth of field, we had mirrors, uh, concave mirrors. And one thing about doing that depth of field is if you move your head uh, to, in response to what's going on, you can make your, your ears will go, oh, we just moved. A, uh, we moved a little bit while your eyes are telling you we just moved a lot. Yeah. And a lot of people would part of that job, which was just awesome, was cleaning up the sick every once in a while. When, <laughs> when somebody was like, oh, <laughs> and freak it out. What's uh, uh, fascinating to me because I'm, I wrote, I, I wrote, I read the 1950s, 60s, 70s science fiction. Um, and you saw some of this all the way back then. Um, some of the things that we're talking about. One of them was a, one of the Asimov Three Laws uh, stories was about a society where no one ever left their home and there was no personal contact between people. Right. Um, and an investigator had to actually go to homes and talk to people. And they're like, why are you coming to my home? Uh, do I have a door? You know, because they had never been outside. Right. Um, they lived in houses in the country and they never stepped outdoors. Um, and then there was an Arthur C. Clarke story. Um, the city, 
the city something city beyond the the city beyond the the, the stars or something like that and it was there was only one city of human beings left in the galaxy and they spent all their days playing games which were essentially ar games but there was a certain limit beyond which you couldn't go and so this one particular guy kept trying to go beyond the limits and it's like oh you you can't go any further that's that's as far as the city goes um and eventually he breaks out and goes off and has real adventures um, the city and the stars hmm? the city, city and the stars, the stars. yeah, yeah. Um, yes, the city and the stars. Because I I read it in the uh, in a compilation book, which was uh, from the oceans from the stars, which also had the deep range in it. Which, since I'm huge into water, was you know I thought that was an awesome story. <laughs> cool. Um, but this, what we are becoming, has already been was already predicted back in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I noticed when, you know, the was with our recruits uh, in the police department, when, just before I was getting out, is none of them had ever touched anybody. Yeah. Like they just, they hadn't, they weren't used to, you know, touching anybody in, in anger or other. Oh, oh, like sparring, like sparring or anything. Yeah. Okay. Or just touching a stranger. Like it was really weird for them to, you know, like, hey, don't do that. And, you know, push them away, that kind of thing, compared huh. to some people of John and my generation where, you know, we were mixing it up all the time. Yeah. Uh, even if you weren't in sports, you ended up having to, yeah, you know. scrap, scrap yeah. by. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, huh. it's fascinating to me that, that that angle was taken on this. And it really is a cool one because, again, self image is involved. And uh, even after Lynn has uh, kind of gone to the next level as far as her performance in the, in the, into the real, she is uh, still haunted by these body image things that, you know, are, are an issue for almost everybody at one point or another in their lives. Yeah. And she continues to kind of hold to that old image of herself when she is completely leveled up, you know, to, according to the reader, you know, you're reading. Yes, yourself, yeah. of course. And, you know, the book cover. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, you know, I, I tend to I, I, once I've bought the book, once it's caught my eye, I tend to try and ignore the covers because oftentimes they're not necessarily the most accurate depiction, or at least the one that's in my yeah, head. Yeah, that's that true. That that's true mind. enough. But in this particular case, it was especially true for me. It's like, I, you know, I have a daughter. My daughter is a teenage uh, young woman. Uh, and for me, that was really cool to see that, you know, the, the, the mental processes and stuff that are going on when, again, when you're external to it, seeing someone going through that, where their image, their body image is different from, uh, or their mental image of themselves is so different from what you're seeing. It's kind yeah. of hard to comprehend that yeah. they have these issues. So yeah. I, I thought that was definitely handled by both of you. It was really, really cool the way, and it wasn't just Lynn that's going through this, but also how mom has to make an adjustment to dealing with how Lynn uh, is doing things in the, in the world, that kind of stuff. So uh, backstory and everything else like Her that. Food consumption has increased. Yeah. Cause it does. Anytime yeah, you start yeah. to exercise, your food, your your consumption increases. Yep, absolutely. Um, That's a, I mean, a star, uh, starvation diet is is necessary. You know, you can't starve and build muscle. It's just not yeah. Possible. So, but uh, really, really cool. So, uh, in, and kind of in that vein, um, which character from Into the Real would you avoid like the plague, and why? <laughs> I guess you're saying you're going first, John. <laughs> oh, I think you might have frozen. No, no, he's thinking. They no, the no, he's they thinking. They don't have the option to avoid. So, you know, which character would in it would you avoid, Robert Crater, because he's trying to get you to do things that you shouldn't do. Uh, I not shouldn't. <laughs> just it might not be the most wise thing in the world. You know, possibly slightly dangerous, maybe. But it'll bring you fame and glory, so you know. And money. Oh yeah, I wouldn't avoid Robert Crater. You might probably because you're probably because you're you're smarter, John. You would avoid him. I wouldn't avoid him. I'm I still wouldn't young have enough. Avoided him in the day. No, <laughs> I mean, when I was Lynn's age, it's like, wow, an opportunity to you know do something really important and you know get some personal identification in the world that I would not otherwise have. 
Yeah. Coming from somebody that's, you know, someone that I hold as a uh, demigod. There's there's hero worship going on there. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely would have. It, at this age, I'd be like, <laughs> anybody who's pitching that hard, yeah. I want to see the fine freaking print, yeah. man. <laughs> No, don't don't volunteer for anything. Don't volunteer for anything. No. That's a, oh, it's that's just a, a beta test of a new <laughs> AR game. That's all it is. Oh, and then I'll take an I'll take an economic hit doing it too. That's the other thing. Oh, and I'll take an economic hit. But only it. but only temporarily, you know, she gets really. to monetize it. <laughs> except except then like they they spring the well, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but yeah, well, they so spring that's, that's they spring additional things on her and so now she's like oh now i gotta do this and yeah. but if she wins like it'll all be paid so back, how, about, so. how about for you lydia um well it's kind of an obvious answer because i'm being realistic here uh, i mean i would have yeah i would have would elena um she's toxic arrogant cruel and just a jerk of a person um it doesn't mean she doesn't deserve empathy and understanding you know again in the real world if i was face to face there you know i would try to still be empathetic but just because you choose to be empathetic to someone and kind to them does not mean, yeah, John's, John's a much meaner person than I am. I'm a much <laughs> kinder person. So let me finish John. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just, be, fine with. Go ahead. just because you choose to empathize with someone does not mean you should give them access to your time and emotion if they are a toxic person. So yeah. while I really look forward to the things we will get to do with Elena in future books, at least in book one, uh, she's just not a person anybody should be spending time around because she needs to get her, she needs to get her ducks in a row, and they are. Uh, Elena's got her ducks in a row. The only okay. Thing to do with the Elena's of the world. The only thing to do with the with the Elena's of the world involves showers and ovens. That's the only thing to do with the Elena's of the world. Okay? So I will point out something that Lynn learned in the book, which is that. The people, the meanest and most, like the meanest, biggest bullies in the world are often the people who are most insecure. That's not true. That's absolutely Okay, untrue. okay, okay. But it works, but it works for the book. <laughs> well, so, so, so for kids, for, for kids, like no, high school. No, bullying actually improves self-confidence. Self okay, but it's no, I'm not talking. But I'm not Ask talking about talk. self. But I'm not talking about self confidence. Um, so <laughs> let's put you it this way: used to be a police officer. Right? Oh, I know, I know. I'm not talking about cops. I'm talking about high schoolers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. When you feel secure in yourself, uh, in my experience, obviously I have a different experience from everybody else in the entire world. So I can only pull from my own experience. Um, when you feel confident in yourself, um, there is usually much less of a drive to be aggressive and to prove something, prove your dominance, prove your intelligence, prove your whatever. And I have observed that the people who are the most skillful and most competent and most smart and wise are usually the quietest people who just sit in the back of the room and they're like, I don't, you, you go ahead. Like I'm good. And it's the people who are the, you know, dumbest. And, and again, I'm, I'm stereotyping here. There's a nuance and everything, but you know, it's the people who don't really have it together, but you know, want nuance. to, want to appear. Yes. Want to appear that they do. So, so I think we're probably got to stick a pin in the, the whole, <laughs> bullying versus not bullying kind of thing. But uh, so we have yours, uh, which you'd like to avoid and uh, like the plague and why. Uh, how about, uh, and I guess you're both in agreement about it. It's, it's Elena, regardless of whether. Regardless you know, of why. <laughs> yeah, the outcomes, exactly. I was uh, joking so about Robert Crater. Yeah, it would be Elena to avoid. But yeah. most people in life try to avoid the Elena's of the world. And you can't, especially if you're in an HOA. I mean, Elena is a future HOA president, okay? <laughs> Elena is a Karen. And, you know, modern terminology, Elena is just, she's the mean girl Karen. She's so, not too. And it's she's funny because I, for me, Elena wouldn't, you know, figure into my thing because for me, she's oppositional. So I wouldn't, for me, it would have been Ronnie because I, I hate overcoming idiots. <laughs> no. You know, I, you're supposed to be on my team <laughs> and you're not on my team. 
This should be easy. <laughs> so for me, it was Ronnie. Again, she wrote Ronnie extremely well. Exactly. I am a I much more I'm a much more sympathetic person than both of y'all because uh, you know, because uh, your next question, ask your next question, Griffin. <laughs> just because of that, I'm going to skip it. Well, okay, yeah, I had something well, I was going to say, well, but okay. So who would you want as your ally or teammate? Well, so I was going to say, first of all, if it's anybody, well, like alpha testers, I would pick Steve hands down. Like I want yeah. Steve on my team. So if we could pick anybody, like Steve, uh, because right. he's obviously one of the most competent characters in the book. But if we're just talking about like the kid, like the kids slash other people who are playing uh, TD Hunter, um, you know, Edgar is a great pick because he's very loyal and very reliable. Um, but I honestly, I'd pick Ronnie because I don't like Ronnie um, because he's a massive jerk face, but he is besides Lynn, the best gamer on their team. Um, if you can stand working with him. So it's like, because for me, like John mentioned, like for me, Ronnie um, was one of the characters that I got more into developing and more into thinking about the psychology of how and why he thinks. It's so that I could write him really well because Ronnie and Lynn's interactions is pivotal, pivotal to their entire character arcs and therefore and, and the, the entire story. plot of the story. And the story. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so I, I'm just, I, again, for me, it was just simply that, uh, you know, in, in the real. I see the potential in Ronnie. I see his potential. Yeah, in the real. And that's what upsets me because I went through 20 years of seeing the potential in people and having them let me down. Yeah, I can I can <laughs> see. I'm a writer. But, I control it. I know what he's going to do. Yeah, absolutely. And and it is that's one of the coolest things about this is that, you know, everybody's got their reasons. I said that earlier. One of the things I think you guys did so well is showing, you know, hey, they may be a dumpster fire, but they probably got their reasons. And we don't necessarily find out everybody's reasons for all their stuff, but just like in real life, into the real. I think that was really really well done. Everybody uses dumpster fire as a metaphor. If it's a really cold day, there's a value to a dumpster fire. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and absolutely. You, you might you might find this interesting, Griffin, but the title, Into the Real, neither of us came up with that title. Mm. Tony came up with that title. So, John, what was your work in progress? It was like Whispers in the Dark or something? Or Whispers yeah, in the Night? Yeah, Whispers in the Dark. Your Whispers in the so Dark. And it was a really crappy work. Like, I'm sorry, John. It was just, that was a crap. I mean... It's a working title. I think I see where you were going with it, but like the story went in a completely different direction. Like yeah, at the one point that you of into the real that didn't really come across was that when I envisioned it, it was a little more of a horror story. And I got um, that from the first draft that you sent me. Because especially when because you know on you not only have um, visual clues, you also have audio clues. And the audio clues are frequently, you get them earlier than you do the visual clues. Yeah. And there's there's some of these that even using the AR systems, they're still invisible, the ghosts, right. the wraiths. Um, but you can hear them. And especially when, you know, she's mostly doing this during the day, but as it gets darker and, you know, she's in the dark and she's dealing with, wraiths and ghosts and it's mostly audio that she's working on it was a uh it was intended to have a very creepy feel um, so i apologize john i absolutely hate horror like i hate i loathe that genre so if you right. wanted more of a horror element you picked the wrong co-author <laughs> well it, it worked out yeah, it no, did work out it was but that was the reason for whispers in the dark which was never going to be the final uh, yes. because yes. It's been used too many times. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I was the trying other, to come up. The oh, other ahead, reason for Whispers in the Dark is specifically the Skillet song, Whispers in the Dark. Well, and so I listened to that quite a bit while I was writing the book. And I actually created a whole Skillet slash, um, uh, oh gosh, what were some of the other guys? I mean, I listened to Skillet and Nightwish and um, Within Temptation, like a bunch of other Honestly, I was I picked up some songs from the Black Tide Rising universe that you used to that I hadn't listened to before, but I knew of the bands and stuff. Anyway, uh, moving on, moving back to the title. So I spent the entire book, the entire book writing it, trying to think of a better name, and I could not come up with anything better. So when I sent Tony, like, my completed draft, I'm like, all right, Tony, here it is. 
John's work in progress title is this. I don't really like it. You know, I, you, maybe you like it. I don't really know what to call this. Do you have any suggestions? Like you guys know how to name books. Like help me out here. And Tony's like, uh, why don't you just call it into the real? Like you step into the real, like, there you go. And it's the slogan of the entire trans dimensional hunter game, the entire yeah. game. The yeah, theme is step into the real. And I cannot believe I didn't come up with that. <laughs> well, I, I can, cause you know, you're, you're in there in the forest amongst the trees. You can't see the, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, Tony's just yeah. like, why, why not just call it into the room? Yeah. Like, Tony, you're about, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about it is, is that, you know, what what seems so hard for some of us can sometimes be dead easy for another. Yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Tony in, came oh, up with the name. <laughs> click the light switch on, you know. <laughs> click. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. That's no, I, and I like the title. I think it's. Uh, oh, it's a it's great really title cool. because yeah. it is the theme of the entire story. Yep. So. So. Uh, Going from the favorite person that you would want to uh, have an al as an ally or teammate, um, uh, Word of Monger or Transdimensional Hunter, which game from Into the Real would you play more? <laughs> what do you keep doing the on the nose? Have you I'm never played in. that? Have you never played in. that? John, you're old. You're old, John. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, that means I'm not I'm not, not it. it. She wants I'm you to answer it. first. Oh, not it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you ever play tag with kids like when you were little or anything? Like when it's like, all right, who's it? Oh, not it. Like whoever does, you know, that's a thing. Kids do that. I did that as a kid. Were you ever a kid, John, or did you come fully formed from your mother's womb? <laughs> He's got a really cool story about being a kid on a train in Turkey. Oh, wow. Okay. So sorry, not to get distracted. John, which game would you play more? I was a slightly different kid than you were. Um... I'm sure. I'm sure we can tell John. We can tell. John. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, you, you know, you're talking. Griffin was saying that you know the the, the recruits coming in now, you know, they, they don't get into anything. You know, they, they never touch other people. My best friend in sixth grade was a Soviet kid named Marco, and we res we wrestled any number of times on the you'd call it a soccer field which was made up entirely of dirt and small rocks. Um, the soccer field, which the uh, Operation Eagle Claw was supposed to land its helicopters on to rescue the hostages because where the hostage was kept was the school that I went to. Wow. Um, my other friend was a Yugoslavian named Masud. I had no American friends for two years. <laughs> <laughs> so do you speak um, Yugoslavian? No. Um, and I never learned Russian either, um, except I remember a couple of the insults. Um, so, yeah, I had a slightly different childhood than you did. Did we play tag? <laughs> yes, we played tag. Was this part <laughs> of it? No, it was not. I don't know when that was introduced. Yeah. Not sure I. Somebody would go, let's play tag. And then they would slap somebody else. You go, you're it. And then you run. Exactly. And you couldn't tag back. Yeah. That was how you started. And then you'd run, in, you'd run into the abandoned house and get scratched up by rusty nails and have tetanus for the next couple of months. You know, yeah. Like yeah. you do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, John, Warmonger or Transdimensional Hunter? Which did you play more? Uh, at my age, Warmonger. Um, TD Hunter would just be way too physical. Um, but uh, yeah, because TD Hunter, unlike uh, the current augmented reality games, involves a involves physical action, which is one of those things that you know it's been pointed out. Yeah, maybe someday, probably not. There's liability issues. Um, yeah. But what's really funny is if you took my generation, or if you took where we were in the 1970s and you and it was the same technology i could see people doing it a lot more yeah because it was a lot more physical period than yeah. present um well also you didn't have to worry about getting sued quite as much and yeah. you didn't have to worry about getting sued quite as much i mean it was you know it, it was a time when there were just people out on the side of the road hitchhiking and gave them rides yeah i, I love the internet meme with the it was the 70s 
and it's got the kid on the go kart jumping on the ramp, and his hair, you know, his, his <laughs> bowl haircut is flying in the back. And, you know, yeah. it, it, it's definitely going to be a death ride for him. But it was the seventies; we just got yep. on with it. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it it was. It's it's really hard to explain, but we didn't do this because you didn't get to call yourself as not yet. <laughs> You had to run. <laughs> okay, so we got one monitor from John. <laughs> Lydia, what's yours? <laughs> I would love to play Transdimensional Hunter. I would just love it. It would be, actually, it would be I would, so much I would fun. enjoy playing the Yeah, it would be it would, would be so much fun. Um I would really enjoy that. And actually in designing Transdimensional Hunter, I was partially designing something that I wanted to play. And right. I did have to think about a lot of the issues like liability that you brought up and fortunately for our purposes the people who design td hunter uh are designing it with uh the end of the world in mind and so they're right. like yeah that's not really an issue let's just yeah. get this done so anyway that was a nice little <laughs> loophole for me we were like oh it's you know that giving away freedom. it's let's just go ahead and lay this out since we've already basically let's not do spoilers come on let's not do avoid the spoilers, spoilers for fans. John loves spoilers. John loves spoilers. And I actually had to argue with him and Tony about how much they spoiled things. Like I had everything laid out to be super like plot twisty. And John and Ray and uh, Tony were like, no, no, we're just going to tell them. I'm like, nah. so tell <laughs> yeah, them tell your, tell in the baby. description of the book. So, so, okay. We got one and one and I, I would actually, cause I, you know, like I like to LARP and stuff like that. So, I think oh, I, I LARP too. Yeah, I LARP too. too. And that's, that's, I love LARPing. But, but as I get older and I'm more and more unable to run around like a chicken with its head cut off, I'd probably go for the warmonger. But being teabagged by a 12 year old, I don't, I don't think I can get into that. You, know? <laughs> you would be. You would be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Reaction times drop off as you get older. Well, they found that there's a very, very specific break point at 24. Hmm. At 24, your capability to react drops just there's just a there's a moment in your life where you're you're here and then all of a sudden you drop to there right um and it's right around when you're 24 mm -hmm. um which is why you do not have elite twitch gamers you know anything that involves twitch yeah. mm -hmm. you don't have elite twitch gamers over 24 because <laughs> they just the other thing they found about this kind of gaming is because uh a lot of med a lot of surgery these days involves this the first thing to ask like if you're if you've got to get a heart transplant or something else you know serious along, along those lines ask the doctor how much gaming they do and yeah. if they are an avid this gamer right forget anything else forget about the reputation forget about anything else if they're an avid this gamer that's who you want because right. so much of what they do now is this that avid gamers are much better surgeons. Right, remoting. Cool. All right, so uh, big battles in the group dynamic of a party of adventures with their all the internal pressures uh, figure prominently in Into the Real. Uh, I I think I, I know the answer to this, but was that baked into the idea when it came to you, or was it something that grew out of the characters themselves? What, what specifically were you describing? The adventurer, you know, kind of the band of adventurers kind of thing that you have going on with uh, all Edgar, Lynn, uh, Ronnie, etc. Well, when I was thinking about the game, I wanted to merge um, Pokemon uh, as it was when, because this is before raids with Pokemon, but I wanted to merge the concept of, of the current AR with more like the World of Warcraft. Um, with M more like, make it more like an more MMO like RPG. MMORPGs, yeah, and bring those together. Um, so it was baked in from the beginning that there would be a group of adventurers, if you will. Um, that there would there would have to be a team, and in the outline, he even talked about things like building it up to the level of companies, right. um, where there would be a larger group of multiple teams that they would be able to share resources amongst themselves. Um, and I don't know if we're actually going to go to there. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. Are. Oh, okay. yeah. It's going to be awesome. David and I have worked it all out. We've got it all okay. ready for book two, like all the mechanics and stuff. 
It's exciting. Let me tell you this. I had lunch with Tony the other day, and there's still more changes coming to the outline. Oh, yeah. Well, I and I that's fine. That's inevitable. I figured I figured there would be. So, But you can't take uh, away my game mechanics from me. No. No, no change to the game mechanics. <laughs> it's some change to the uh, to the personality mechanics. I think I think that would be fun. Cool. Because there's enough so characters. You, know, you just you just revealed that we got second book on the way. That's that's oh yeah. Fun. Oh the yeah. The fans are going to eat that up. Tony so, has also 100 percent said the third book. Well, cool. we've so, written we've signed a contract for three books. Okay. Yes, but it's the thing the about book. it is that there's ways to get around that. But Tony's 100 percent that it has to be three books. Yeah. Well, so, one of the okay. things one of the things you need to know is that when we sit down before you start writing, we've got to we've got to work out um, the outline for book three. So yeah, we have to have yeah. two and three completely yep. outlined. Yep. And she wants you to go direct from writing book two direct to book three. I plan. I plan on. I've already set up my my writing schedule this year, planning for that. So we're, okay. we're good to go there. Um, well, that's exciting. I, I I am having a baby around October first, so there's okay. going to be that. But uh, as anyone, What's that, number three. Yeah, number three. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, cool. So as anyone uh, who knows me though will tell you, uh, I am a workaholic and I hate not working. So I didn't actually take a maternity leave for either of my other two kids. I was like, where? Because like you have a kid and you're like, I'm free. <laughs> like let's do stuff. So <laughs> usually cool. I'm rearing to go as soon as I have a kid. It's just the sleep deprivation that the sleep deprivation is the thing that, that gets to you. Wow. But um, no, I was going to say that when frequently helps sleep deprivation frequently <laughs> helps. <laughs> well, so when John originally pitched this idea to me back in 2017, um, he pitched it as a trilogy. And so when he was taking it to Tony, um, I think it was, it was mid to late 2019 when he uh, pitched it to her the second time. Cause the first time, according to John, she told him, you already have too much other stuff under contract. You need to finish, finish that. And then we can talk about a new project. That is my remembrance of what John said, John apologies if I got that wrong. But anyway, when he pitched it to her, that, okay. yeah, when, when, yeah, I do. <laughs> Cause I'm like, yeah, we know this about John. Um, so in 2019 fall sometime when he pitched it to her again, initially she was like, okay, let's try it as one book. And I'm like, like John and I were not physically in the same place, but we kind of like over email, like looked at each other. And we're like, Oh no, this is not happening. Like it's three books. So John, you know, talked to Tony around and we got the contract for the, for the trilogy. So anyway, that's how that it's happened. It's an excellent uh, beginning. I look forward to seeing the next two. Um, yeah. So, uh, I already teams, have people breathing down my necks, being like, "When's the next? Where is it? I want the next one." That's kind of that's. I think John, John will tell us both that that's okay. that's the life. Yep, yep, and I have no objection to it. <laughs> Where's the next Troy book? Yeah, yeah. I, people would ask you that for like decades. <laughs> so, uh, teams and team building are both a huge factor in the story and in the heroine's journey. Uh, was that intentional, a natural outgrowth of the character's needs and wants, or uh, did the story kind of demand it of itself? It were definitely not Lynn's needs and wants. Lynn did not want a team. No, Lynn didn't want a team. Lynn yeah. needed a team. Yes, yeah, she did. Lynn need needed a team, team for her own personal character growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that is so very true. That was in part created because of what I saw as the need for the Lynn character to grow. Um, eventually what Lynn needs to do, and if we can get it together right, um, Lynn needs to graft Larry the Snake to herself. And she did that a little bit, a couple of times in this book, but she needs to become much more, because Lynn is Larry. She shouldn't, she could make up this character and she could write a bunch of things down but what she hasn't grasped yet is that what makes Larry, Larry, is very much a part of Lynn. Right. That the truth is that she is a very, very strong leader, someone who is ready to bite your head off if you don't do what she wants. But she has, she's been trained into passivity in terms of personal relationships. And what she needs to learn is that 
being nice and being, you know, the 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 person who holds everybody together through cooperation and everything is great. But there comes a time when she has to kick ass. Um, and that is and eventually she's she is um, going to bring those two characters together and realize that she is Larry. Deep down inside, there's Larry is there. And she needs to release her inner Larry. But I really want to hold that moment for... It can't happen until the third book. Yeah, it can't happen until the third book. Like, yeah. So obviously Lynn has a very long journey to go on before that moment occurs. Yeah. That's why you see flashes of it in the first book. One of the first things that I ever got published um, was in a textbook. And it was an essay on music videos. Back when VH1 actually had music Music videos. videos. Um, And I was taking a 20th century humanities course. And the teacher said, you had to write a 5,000 word essay. And the teacher said, uh, go to to the theater, see the opera, see ballet, something along these lines. Do something new was one of the, you know, the descriptions was do something new. And I went around and I said, well... Um, I really prefer German opera. Um, I'm not really an Italian opera kind of guy. Um, I, I really like the Nibelung. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen this play and this play, and I guess the Christie plays are great. Um, I actually went to the Mousetrap when it ran. It was like, had been running for 24 years in London. Um, I really like Swan Lake, but it's about the only ballet that I really get into. If you want me to do something new, how about music videos? <laughs> so I sat up for 18 hours and watched VH, VH1's top 100 music videos of the year for, it's be like 1988. Um, 18 hours of just watching that music was, videos. That was the year before I was born. That was the year before you were born, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and... One of them was uh, We'll Be Together Tonight. And what I loved about that video was that it was so metaphorical because it showed Sting in two different modes. It showed him as the the crazy bohemian and as the more sober person. And then at the end of it, both of them are shown and, and he's there with his wife girlfriend in a limo and it's what shows is that you know we are now he and on the surface it's he and his girlfriend are now together but the reality is he's saying that we are now joined that that those different parts of him are joined together well that's what we'll be together tonight is really about um stings songs and the police were always really very deep um and that was, although it wasn't the top video of the year, I said that, that one, from the point of view of artistry, was the best. Um, and so what I'm looking for in this is Lynn's journey to being together. That she finally grasps that, yes, she is a leader. And that there's no question about that. Um, and she no longer has any question about it. She is confident about it by grafting Lynn and Larry into one person. That was a very, very long explanation for something. Um, but that that is sort of the, the whole purpose of this trilogy, is to take those two characters and graft them together. That is the, that is the hero's journey in this building Roman coming of age story. Cool. Lydia? Um, well, I mean, I kind of already said my part, which is that it was definitely not Lynn's need or want. Right. <laughs> um, right. But the the mechanic, um, <clears throat> it wasn't just a mechanic that was necessary to develop Lynn, but honestly, a mechanic that was necessary to tell um, the story. I mean, it was a necessary mechanic um, for the purpose of the game because the purpose of the game is not what most people think the purpose of the game is. And right. so in most games, um, you know, they're like really high, like t- competition games, which are almost completely 
I mean, they are all completely, you know, virtual. Sometimes there are big game tournaments that happen where you are physically in the same building, but a lot right. of them are happening where you are at your own house or set up wherever, and you're gaming with people from around the world in these competitions with millions and millions of dollars in, um, in reward money. Um, obviously, like a lot of them do have a team aspect, um, you know, and you've got WoW and, and stuff like that, but usually when people think of gaming, they don't think of a team so much as like the individual and who's the top dog. And so it's, it's interesting, you know, when they make, <clears throat> well, when this develops in the story, um, how some people are, I mean, Lynn's like, dang it. Why a team? Like, why, why can't I just do this and just do my own thing and just win it and be amazing. I have to rely on other people. Um, and so that, the, the entire team building of all of the teams all around the world for TD Hunter, there is a very important specific purpose for all of that, which everyone will find out about at the end of it right. too. So. One of the coolest things Spoilers. I got out of, out of that team aspect was the, was both Steve and uh, I, I want to say Whitmore, the neighbor. Uh, um, no, it's Jerry. Uh, it's um, Gerald Thomas. Thomas Gerald right. Thomas. That's right. So the uh, Steve and, and Thomas is uh, kind of that NCO approach to you have an idiot idiot lieutenant. How do you get around him? I, I thought that was excellent. <laughs> well, so I I I was not in the Marines, but I was in the military. I went through Marine Corps training to be an officer. Um, did not complete the training by choice. Um, because I discovered near the very end before commissioning, I finally admitted to myself that I was absolutely terrible at taking orders. Not terrible in that I, I couldn't fulfill the orders, but that I got really angry when people told me what to do. <laughs> and to this day, if you want to make me angry, I, I mean, not in like a professional setting, but you know, if like we're just hanging out and, and you like start ordering me, I'm like, uh, heck no, excuse me. Like I'm going to do my thing. You know, I just don't like being told what to do. It just raises my hackles. Right. Um, and so I just, I finally admitted to myself that I was probably going to get court martial. I was going to just blow up at some point if I decided to join the military professionally. Um, and also, self. yeah, well, I mean, and I really wanted to be in the Marine Corps. I, I wanted it with all my heart and I still, um, miss many aspects of it and, uh, wish that I could have been in the military. However, it was not for me. I was not, I had many, many very strong points and was top of my class in a lot of ways, um, but did not fit the mold. I was not a mold fitter. Um, and so I, I, so I voluntarily left the program. But for a time there, for you know, four years, I was going through military, you know, Marine Corps officer training. Um, and I absolutely adored so many things about it. <clears throat> and so a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, well, I absolutely don't have um, John Ringo's, you know, experience um, being a military member, especially active duty in terms of like the prof professional development from an officer standpoint. Um, it was a lot of fun getting to kind of like work that in. Um, and I actually had a character in a scene that is, was kind of minor that John cut out. So you'll never get to know that was another like former military guy with some professional development, you know, stuff going on there. But oh, cool. John and Tony just, I, I mean, it was John, it wasn't Tony. John, John was the meanie. He was like, nope, we don't need this. You know, I'm totally ragging on you, John. Yeah. <laughs> I left spoons. You yeah, have you no idea. spoons is you awesome. You have no idea how close spoons I came. Spoons is awesome. No, if you had said you wanted to cut that, I would have fought for it. I would was... have fought so hard because that scene was very, very important to the development of the team. Wouldn't you agree, Griffin? Wouldn't uh, you no agree? Comment. No comment. No <laughs> comment. I would have fought you and Tony on that scene. There's a huge <laughs> aspect, and this is professional development, Lydia. Okay. <laughs> there is a line in a Bob Seger song, what to leave in, what to leave out. Mm -hmm. And a huge aspect of writing, any type of writing, is what to leave in, what to leave out. Mm -hmm. You have no clue how much stuff I leave on the cutting room floor. You don't. I know. I'm um, sorry, you're right. I don't, but also I can imagine. The other thing is that uh, Tony has already said that you're shooting for way too high numbers, way too high word count. 
Oh, yeah. I'm not shooting for it. I'm not shooting okay. for it. It just happens. It happens. <laughs> well, if we go to that high word count the next time, uh, my red pen is coming out. Yeah, I will, I will be, I will, my intention is to keep it uh, much, much smaller. I mean, I mean, not much. 100 much to 120 smaller. is what we're looking at. Yeah. You were talking 150 to 160. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Good thing to keep in mind. But yeah, so, I am definitely. Well, writing involved. But writing is fun. So that, that for me, again, trying to stay away from process so much, but for me, it's probably not much less writing involved because you got to get the right scenes in there, right? So Exactly, yeah. Exactly. You know, writing a, writing more to cut a bunch of stuff and leave it on the floor is, is always yeah. kind of, that's the, the yeah. painful decisions that you have to make. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the uh, second to last question here, the penultimate question, what aside from its considerable raw entertainment value? Uh, do you hope readers will carry with them long after reading into the real? I'm going to respectfully say I that. always go for just raw entertainment value, man. I, I don't, I, I, I don't message. Okay. Um, that would kind of be in the message area. I'm kind of worried about people <clears throat> worrying that I'm messaging in this because one of the things about it is, is that it is more of a polyglot, group that I normally have. I mean, think about uh, Under Graveyard Sky. It's a family of four who are all white. Right. You know, it's a very standard nuclear family are the center of the, the whole story. This is a lot more shades. Yeah. And I did those shades not because I wanted to do shades because in 2022 you have to have shades. I did those shades because they just made a hell of a lot more sense. Um, but I can see some John Ringo readers going, John Ringo's gone to the left. No. <laughs> okay. It just made more sense. Lynn's environment, she is simply not going to be in a pasty white environment. She's no. not. She's not pasty white. Um, because it's unlikely that she would be. Um, so it's it's it was all about reality but is there something to take away from it that people can grow um it, there was nothing in this at all whatsoever that i put into it myself that had anything to do with well for younger adults it's that you can grow it's that you can face challenges in your life, okay? Um, and, you know, people say, oh, it's a YA. Most of Heinlein's best books were YA, okay? Yeah, so if you're a classic science about. fiction reader, yeah. think of it as this is Heinlein for the, for the 2020s because that, that was my whole approach um, was that it was a Heinlein YA. It wasn't Hunger Games or, you know, something like that. So the only thing, if you're a younger person and you're facing, right now, oh my God, are younger people facing challenges. And this is a very, very challenging time. You can face challenges and overcome them. That's the only thing to, to take away from it. And for older readers, it's just a fun story. And, you know, what are people our age going to take away from anything that they read that isn't a nonfiction book? You know, um, the golden age of science fiction is a 13-year-old. Okay? And it was written with that in mind. But everybody enjoys Heinlein juveniles. Right. I still read them. You still read them. I mean, you know, I still read Guardi um, Citizen of the Galaxy from time to time, and that's a straightforward YA right. with a lot of very mature, and by, that, by mature, I don't mean sexual or anything like that, with a lot of mature themes in it. Into the Real is a YA with a lot of mature themes in it. Cool. Lydia? <laughs> well, I am a messenger. <laughs> um, which kind of goes back to the whole, like, plotting. And when I set out to tell a story, um, I'm, like, it absolutely has to be entertaining. Obviously, it has to be fun. Um, but also, for me personally, the way I consume stories... Um, the stories that mean the most to me are stories in which um, 
you learn things. And it's not, and I'm not talking about like preaching from a soapbox, obviously, because that's the worst way you could ever message in a book. Um, Ready Player One does a very bad job of that. Ready Player One has a lot of soapbox preaching. Um, but it's the stories where that just organically show life lessons through the lives of the people in them. And, you know, sometimes that just happens whether you mean it to or not. It just, you know, the, it's the story you're telling. Um, for me, I do try to deliberately craft my prose and especially the conversations between people, the relationship building. Um, I, I try to specifically craft that in a way that is thoughtful, um, meaningful and realistic because it's those it's seeing these characters develop these relationships that help us better understand our own psychology and our own relationships with other people. Um, and so because of that, to me, the message of this book is, you know, or, or I, what I hope people take away, no matter their age. Um, like I would disagree with John on this point that, I mean, this is a message that I think is vital for any age no matter what, because we're always growing, that you need to respect and love yourself enough to face your fears and fight what you believe in and make healthy life choices. And that's a hard, there's a freaking hard thing to do. doesn't matter what your age is. That is hard. And everybody has different seasons in life where they're facing different kinds of fears because you've got your high school fears and then you've got like your newly married, like raising a family fears, or maybe like new, if you're not married, if you're you know, in your new profession, and then you've got your, you know, I'm like a pro at my field, but now I'm like having to lead people and like all this professional felt like every new season has its own struggles and fears. And like, you're always discovering more things about yourself and always discovering foibles and faults that maybe you didn't even notice before that now like they're being put to a stress test. And so for me, I just hope people read this and come away encouraged and feeling like on fire and like, like, I can do this. Like, Lynn did it. I can totally do this. And so I, I hope it's encouraging to people. I hope it's freaking amazing fun. And I hope it's encouraging to people and, and they can feel inspired by uh, that story to maybe face some of their own fears and, and fight a little bit harder for what they believe in. So, Well, I think you guys hit the mark on that. Uh, certainly, it's a, it's a really enjoyable read. And uh, by, as you and John were both saying, uh, coming from different angles, it, you know, supporting people's uh you know vision of yeah i can you know yeah i can i can get this done or yeah there's somebody else who's an exemplar of how i can do this kind of thing mm -hmm. uh whatever challenge it is i'm facing so I, I you know for parents the whole relationship between the mom and the daughter and kind of letting go a little bit but making sure that they don't you know kick them out the door while they do that <laughs> uh really cool um so uh moving on from just into the real Let's talk about where people can actually see you in the real in the upcoming year. Uh, or if you have other books that are going to be coming out, that kind of thing. Oh, too. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go, John. I love it. Um, so anyway, I'll, I will definitely be there at Liberty Con. So basically, if anyone wants a copy of Into the Real signed in person by both John and me, the only place they're going to be able to have it done is at Liberty Con. And it's super sad for people because it's already sold out and has been sold out all year long. <laughs> so basically either you're going to be there or you're not. Um, so definitely Liberty Con. Um, I, if people are local to Kentucky, I have several book signings set up in the Louisville, Lexington, Cincinnati area, which people can read about on my website. Um, but for people who are not local to Kentucky, yeah, I'll be at Liberty Con. I will also be at Dragon Con. Um, assuming there's no complications. Uh, and then I believe the next one I plan to be at is 20 Books Vegas, which is not so much a fan convention. That's more of a pro con. Um, right. So that'll be in Las Vegas in November. And I might be at a little Harry Potter themed convention called Conjuration in November in Atlanta, but I'm not sure because that one and 20 books are right next to each other. So I might have to drop them. The conjuration because 20 books costs an arm and a leg and you know i'm not gonna drop that one um so yeah i'm not doing as many conventions this year as i usually do um uh, for obvious reasons um also to get more work done um but i also have signed book plates of john's 
we got that worked out. So anybody cool. who um, comes to one of my book signings for the book launch um, will be able to get a signed book plate from John. Um, but for in-person signings, that's going to have to be Liberty Con. Cool. And uh, short fiction or any other work that's going to be coming out in the next uh, year at this at the simultaneous with this? Um, there's another, uh, there's an anthology coming out that has one of my stories in it that I believe it's called um, Chicks in Tank Tops. Um, which Jason Cordova is heading that one up. And I do not know the release for that, but I heard that it might be sometime this fall. So I'm not really sure on that since I haven't, I haven't seen a cover or anything yet. Like, I don't know if it's going to make it into the fall release. So it may be more like winter 2023. Um, but that has a short story in it, which was a lot of fun to write. Uh, a teenager hijacks her dad's AI tank to go rescue her dad. Who's been framed for treason. So it's a lot of fun. And the tank's cool. like, young lady, what are you doing in my cockpit? Where is your father? You know, and she, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, cool. so that hopefully will be coming out in chick, Chicks and Tank Tops um, at some point in the fall or, or early 2023. And beyond just short stories that I'm doing for my own, like, patrons on Patreon, um, I'm 100% focused on getting writing the next two inch of the reel, so I don't have any other book releases planned. Cool. John, you got anything else as well? Uh, Black Tide. The um, comic book? Uh, yeah, we've got the Black Tide uh, graphic novel is coming out. Sorry, graphic cool. novel, yeah. Can't wait um, for that. And, uh, and we've got another Black Tide anthology coming out. Yep. Um, which, yeah, it's called United We Stand. Um. And is that going to release yeah. this year or is that going to be released next year? Good question. Kelly. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I just I saw the due date on it, so I, I'm, I'm yeah, hoping I think it's going to release it. next year. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I know that I've got coming out this year new is Into the Room. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Lydia and John. Thanks we for having us, Griffin. You're I'm a sure great host. Are gonna... <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure the fans will very much appreciate hearing from John and I'll see you at Liberty con uh, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing a physical copy of uh, into the reel for myself too. Well, I've got, I've got my physical copy here. Yeah, but so. it doesn't count if you're holding it. <laughs> oh, even... okay. 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 Well, I'll try and hold on to some of my, uh, some of my trans dimensional hunter uh, counterforce buttons. Well, I'll hold on to one of those for you for cool. Liberty con. So, well, thanks much. Okay. And again, thank you everybody for watching. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony worlds Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a cobra. They stood atop a five-story building, looking over the edge of the ground below and the reinforced wall facing them about 15 meters away. He's got to be kidding, Halloran murmured at Johnny's side. Johnny nodded wordlessly, his eyes shifting to buy as the instructor finished his verbal description of the maneuver and stepped to the edge to demonstrate. As always, Bai said, you start with a targeting lock to give your computer the range. Then you just jump. His legs straightened convulsively, and an instant later he was arcing toward the facing wall. He hit it feet first about five meters down, his shoes scraping loudly as they slid a short distance further down along it. The combination of that friction plus the impact-absorbing bending of his knees flipped him partly over, and when his legs straightened again an instant later, the push sent him back toward the original building in a heels-overhead flip that somehow managed to have him feet forward when he struck the side, another five meters closer to the ground. Again he shoved off, 
and with one final bounce and flip off the far wall, he landed safely on the ground at the base of their building. Nothing to it, his voice drifted up to the waiting trainees. I'll be up in a minute, then we'll all try it. He disappeared inside. I think I'd rather take my chances with a straight jump, Nofki said to no one in particular. That's fine for a five-story building, but you'd never make it with anything really tall. Deutsch shook his head. We do have some real cities on Adirondack, you know. I'll bet the Great Horizon Hope could give you a dozen more reasons why this is a good maneuver, Viljo put in, smiling sardonically at Johnny. Would you settle for two? Johnny asked calmly. One, you're never in free fall for very long this way. And besides making for a softer landing, that'll play havoc with any manual or auto-target weapon they try shooting at you. And two... With your legs pointing up most of the time, your anti-armor laser's in good position to fire at whatever you were escaping from on the roof. He had the satisfaction of seeing some of the other trainees nodding in agreement, and of watching Viljo smirk sour into a grimace. There was more, much more, and for ten days, Bai put them through their paces. Gradually, the daily computer modules began to remove the restraints set onto their most dangerous equipment— just as gradually, the scorched lasers and dye pellets used by their metallic opponents were replaced by genuine weapons. Half a dozen of the trainees picked up minor burns and pellet wounds, and a new seriousness began to pervade the general attitude. Only Deutsch retained his bantering manner, and Johnny suspected it was simply because he was already as serious beneath the facade as the man could possibly be. The evening lectures were replaced by extra training sessions— giving them the chance to practice with their enhanced night vision the techniques they had so far used only in daylight and dusk. All of it seemed to be building to a head, and then, almost unexpectedly, though they all knew the schedule, it was over. Almost. "'There comes a time, Cobras,' Bai told them that final afternoon, "'when training reaches a saturation point, where drills and practice don't hone so much as fine polish.' Fine polishing is okay if you're a gemstone or an athlete, but you're neither. You're warriors, and for warriors there's no substitute for genuine combat experience. So, starting tomorrow morning, combat is what you're going to get. Four days of it. Two solitaire and two in units. You'll be up against the same remotes you've been training with. Your own weapons and abilities will be identical to what you'll have when your combat nanocomputers are implanted in you five days from now. So, it's 1600 hours now, and you're all officially off duty until 0800 tomorrow, when you'll be taken by transport to the test site. I suggest you eat tonight as if you'll be on field rations for four days, which you will be, and get a good night's sleep. Questions? Unit dismissed. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks, as always, to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkiewicz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to John Ringo and Lydia Scherer for talking about Into the Real with us today. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirerod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.